You're listening to Creep Geeks Podcast. Welcome to the Creep Geeks Podcast, Season 6, Episode 226. Thomas Divide Overlook, The Little Known Cherokee Lights, and North American Hyena Cryptid. Yeah. So, welcome to the podcast. I'm Greg. I'm Omi. And we're going to talk about stuff we find to be interesting. And hopefully you will, too. Yeah. Okay, so anyway, it is our season six. We've been doing this for six long seasons, episode number 226, and we decided to change things up just a little bit when it comes to the music selection. Yeah. So, hopefully you like it. If you don't, that's okay. If you have <laughs> suggestions, uh, keep them to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> or you can let us know. We have a website you can contact us on. We have a contact form and a Facebook group. Yep, Creep Geeks Facebook group. Yeah. And we have our official Facebook page, Creep Geeks Podcast. That's where we make big announcements and post stuff. Yes. yes. So with this particular season, we figured we'd start to uh, sort of concentrate on some of the uh, things that happen around the area in which we live. And we actually live in Western North Carolina. There's lots of neat things around here. And it's part of the whole uh, Appalachian Mountains and that whole sort of yeah. legends and lore sort of cryptid type thing. And uh, honestly, uh, why not? There's a lot of weird stuff that happens around here. And one of the things that we've been trying to do is get out and find uh, some of the things locally. And when we, and by local, I mean within about a 250 mile radius of where we currently are broadcasting from our underground bunker. Yeah. And one of the things that we like to do is go out and try to find these, uh, luminous uh what do you call them luminous um <laughs> balls of light no there's a term for it like luminous phenomena and you may be familiar with the brown mountain lights but uh, there are other lights out there spook lights ghost lights haint lights whatever you want to call them uh luminous phenomena is a thing hmm. and one of the things that we came across was and this is from talking to you know some local people and and basically seeing some things that are uh uh on the internet uh, about another set of ghost lights or spook lights or haint lights or luminous phenomena. That's not that far away from us. And when I first seen these, they were referred to as the Cherokee lights. Yeah. But they're more commonly referred to as the Thomas divide overlook lights or just Thomas divide overlook. And along the parkway, because we're talking about the Blue Ridge Parkway, there's all sorts of just weird places that you can go and sort of check out. It's pretty easy. You can drive the parkway, and you just sort of pull over and enjoy the splendor. And that's what we did. We jumped in the car, and we uh, hit the parkway, and we kind of came across, um, well, some Brown Mountain light-type phenomena out there. And this was what made it so strange. When you pull into this overlook, which is just basically a parking spot, and you sit there, it kind of goes like this. There's a sort of a little legend behind the whole thing, right? You pull in and you park, and you shine your headlights, like flick your headlights, and then you'll see these lights light up. Allegedly. Yeah, allegedly. We're like, well, that, that's not, okay, whatever, you know, not, not really a big deal. But what made this whole, the whole thing sort of creepy for us is that we went to the Overlook in part of the Great Smoky Mountain, uh, Great Sp- was a great smoky what's the name of the park i can i can never get this right because you see you you border tennessee and north carolina great smoky mountains national park yes if you've never been there before it's long it goes hundreds of miles you could be in the blue ridge mountains in virginia you could be in tennessee you yeah, could you be can, in north carolina like roanoke virginia all the way down into tennessee so where we are, we're sort of centrally located, if you will. And so you go in there and you pull in the parking spot, you flick your lights. If the lights light up on this mountain ridge across from you, there's like a big valley. And there you go. You've seen what they call the Cherokee lights or the Thomas Divide Overlook lights. Right? Mm-hmm. And so that's what we did. But what we didn't realize was is that there's more that goes to this phenomenon than just the lights. Yeah. We're talking weird sounds, weird noises. You know, some people say they hear whispers and 
and talking and murmurs and stuff like that, right? And so this is one of these stories that sort of builds over time as far as what you're going to see. Like what you may see or hear depends completely on you, and a lot of it's based off of Cherokee lore and legends about, you know, witch doctor or shaman that was killed, and then now he haunts the woods because his whole entire family was killed, right? Yeah. And, and like soldiers and some of it is word of mouth because like everything we initially found was just re- in regards to seeing the lights, yes. but not the other stuff where we talk to locals, we talk to people in the region and we we're hearing completely different. Right. Like yeah. there's, there's part of the story says, instead of like shining your lights, you know, flicking your headlights, cause you can do this all from your car, you know, and anytime you can take a, an excursion to seek out some paranormal type stuff in your car and just sit there and possibly experience a phenomenon I'm all about because see, you're already in a position to be able to turn the key and drive away. (laughs) Yeah. But like even with doing some of the research, flicking the lights, you know, pulling back, showing the headlights of your car, you know, can, can provoke the lights, right? Mm -hmm. Some people say you have to honk your horn. Yeah. To provoke the lights. But that sounds like a blending of like one of the other spooks right. we're looking into, and it's, you know. And there's even another one that says that you know, why you get there, you're you're the intent of why you're there, is what draws the phenomena to you, hmm. which is kind of the way you know the way it is with a lot of things. But you know, people talk about like like the lights will start off pretty bright, they get scattered throughout the mountain range across the other side, they flicker, they they go up into the sky, they stay bright, they change to blue, they fade, they do rhythmic patterns. Wait, Some are red. So intent is what forms your experience for these? That's what some people say, but that can be the same thing for a lot of things because there's a phenomenon where you go out in the woods, right, where you may experience seeing Dogman and I may experience seeing Bigfoot. Or aliens. Yeah. 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 And so some of the local Cherokee lore says that that's where people would go to, you know, face like a great challenge and become a man. Huh. And we found that out when we went and we actually left the Thomas Divide Overlook, right, where we went to go see the Cherokee lights, because honestly, we didn't know they were referred to as the Thomas Divide lights until after, and actually met a local fella and talked to him for a while about it. And the thing I noticed about this entire thing is, is that when you're there with the intent to see something, you may or may not see something, but it wasn't so much seeing the lights for us that sort of creeped me out about the entire thing. It was what was happening where we were is what started to creep me out. Let me set the scene for you. We pulled in. We parked. Yeah. And then you got out and walked around and looked, right, to see if there was a better vantage point. And then a car left, because it's only about 10 spots. It's weird. It's a pull-off. There's like 10 spots. You're overlooking this valley-looking thing, you know. Yeah, and a lot of the spots, um, there's trees right in front of your view. Yeah, so you can't see anything, right? And. The idea of you're supposed to be flicking your lights in the car just kind of made sense to stay in the car. But yeah. but then we moved, right? Because somebody moved. And then we parked, reparked, in a better vantage point where we could actually look across the valley onto the ridge on the other side to see these lights. Yeah. And so we reparked. And we sat there for a while. Didn't really see anything at all. And then sort of about 20 minutes later, it became... Um, duskish. Yeah, it started to get you know, it started to get good and dark, right? Because it yeah. was dusk, dusky. Is it yet yeah, when we yeah. got there? You know, so we pulled the van into the other spot, and then after about twenty minutes, I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and set up a camera. Yeah. Because for those of you who don't know or tuning in for the very first time, and we're glad to have you here, we have a van that we travel in, and we are outfitting that van to do this sort of investigation stuff, whether it's like paranormal or UFO or cryptid for us to be able to go places and sort of set up shop and be able to do investigations. And so, you know, with the power of Amazon at our disposal, (laughs) we've been buying things to try to outfit the van. And one of the things that I want is I want like that sort of night vision camera set up to where we can have cameras on the van at a higher vantage point, be able to record all around us. And and just, you know, in case we're in an area where that becomes a, a pertinent investigation method. So we set up a camera. It's a night vision camera. We set it up. We stuck it on a high vantage point on the van, and we just started recording. Hmm. And over time, it became obvious that some of the things that we were looking at across this valley, and it's dark, and these cameras aren't the best because we're not made out of money, were these lights, these lights that are on the ridge, right? We started seeing them, and it's like when I first started looking at them, I'm like, what are these things? Because they're off on the other side, and you're like, okay, because they... And they're downward. Yeah. Yeah. 
And it's like they're sort of, you know, you're at a little bit of a higher elevation than the other ridge on the other side. And, for, you know, with our experience with brown mountain lights and things like that, you kind of got to – brown mountain lights, you're looking up at them. It's kind of a strange thing. But we're skeptical. So I'm looking for things like, is this really just a car? Is it headlights from a car? Is it somebody's house lights? Is it, you know, power line lights? What is it? You know, what? because you're looking across mountain mountain ridges, right? Yeah. And they're not. They weren't. They were lights on the ridges, and some would blink steady, and then another one would blink steady. And when you're looking through the camera and when you're sitting there looking at some of the, uh, the footage that we have, it only looks like maybe there's a half inch in between one light to the other, sort of parallel with each other. Yeah. But, but that's really like two miles almost. I yeah, mean, it's a, a distance, you know, it's, so there's a pretty big distance there. And it's like, plus a dip because that was a thing. It was like a ravine almost. And from across the ravine, they were kind of blinking, not in tandem, not in sequence or ever, but almost in response. Yeah. And a skeptic could be like, oh, well, maybe it's two hunters signaling each other. But it didn't seem that way because the level of blinking, I guess, especially because it was persistent. Yeah. And then it, the one, there's one that's like kind of in the upper corner of some of our footage. And it didn't even coincide with no. the other lights. And then I seen one that lit up and then sort of blinked for a second and then just flew off. And that's it. <clears throat> it just went straight up and went out like the, like the light was gone. And so when I'm, I'm looking at our footage, I'm trying to discern, okay, the distance, like how, about how far away is that? Is it just like a really small insect or something, like a firefly that was out there that went away? And, and I can't because it, it there's a tree yeah, where you park, and it's in the way, and this thing went behind the tree, and it just went to where another light was and went up. So we kept seeing these lights, and, you know, I have like different – sort of clips that we've been sort of editing to put together to show these lights. And, and, and you know, and it is not groundbreaking. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not. It's not groundbreaking footage where you're like, whoa. It's like, man, it looks like these guys recorded this with a potato. But yeah. you can still see it. And, and granted, you know, hey, like I said, you know, we're not, we're not made out of money. We man, were already know? trying struggling because we were struggling to position the van as well as the camera at a good angle. And what you see is what y'all got. So Yeah, and the expectations that we had really don't, they didn't really add up to anything. Because, see, we, we, we read some of the stories about how you're supposed to summon these lights and what they could mean. And they was just all over the place. And it was muddy, right? The whole thing was kind of muddy as in yeah. the clarity of what's supposed to happen and the intent behind what you're going to see and what to experience or expect from being there looking across Thomas divide overlook. But to speak on, on expectations, like you said, uh, we had all these different stories and accounts. We had limited information and what we know as far as the internet world is concerned, the lack of information can say two things, either not a lot of people have seen it or Many people have tried to see it, and it was a dead end. So, yeah. you know, we're like not really, you know, we didn't have high expectations. Some of the stories we've received have been incredible, and some have been like, eh, kind of hinky, you like, know? Yeah, sort of lackluster. But with, it's almost a hidden gem. Yeah. You know, and, and that's part of it, too, because like when you read about this sort of thing or when you talk to people, they'll say, oh, it's nothing like the Brown Mountain Lights. <laughs> And we've seen the Brown Mountain Lights on several occasions, and we've been trying to capture footage when we go up there, and because that's one of the reasons why we're like, hey, let's spend some money and slap some cameras on the van and do all this stuff. And to me, they looked a lot, awful lot like Brown Mountain Lights, but just more stationary than the ones that we've seen. I would like to put a caveat to that. They look like the Brown Mountain Lights when you're witnessing them from a different vantage point. Well, yeah. Yeah, not the Brown Mountain Light Overlook, because the Brown Mountain Light Overlook is more towards uh, aerial phenomenon, like higher up, Right. whereas the other vantage points, which we've investigated for Brown Mountain, it's like that in the ravine, in the the center of it all type stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things that we came across, to kind of give you an idea of the method that you're supposed to do to be able to see these lights, like it's like an instruction set. Upon arrival, flash your headlights and honk your horn. Also, while viewing the lights, many people like to yell at the lights. For some reasons, they seem to enjoy interaction. It's best to go on a clear fall winter night. 
although it will be colder, uh, it makes for best viewing of the lights. However, one of the most important things, and it may sound silly, is to keep an open mind and send out positive thoughts. Remember that farmer we interviewed back in 2019 and he walked away before we could get him on the on the recorder and he said, Thomas Divide, you stand at the edge and you shout downward. Yeah. And you, but never say your name. Yeah. Yeah. And don't whistle and all. You know, yeah. And that was part of it, but it's like. And he whistled. <laughs> yeah. And, and so here's what seems to be going on. You show up and you do these steps in order to be able to see and possibly interact with the lights. But what doesn't seem to really come out too often is the area that you're in is sort of weird yeah so we were seeing the lights you know and trying to record them and do all that sort of thing and at one point uh during our little adventure and we're about maybe an hour and a half in i thought that we were being a little too loud because you know i kept hearing talking and whispers and and noises and stuff and i thought because sometimes you do that right if somebody if you're in a like in a parking lot with like 10 parking spaces, we're on the very end closest to be able to look over the overlook. So where you would pull in the very first spot you come straight into. And I thought that maybe we were being too loud. And so that the other cars in the parking lot, people were talking as well. And they had to speak a little louder mm-hmm. to be able to hear themselves. I mean, we weren't like yelling or anything like that, but we were talking in a normal tone. And you said, we are the only ones here. It was loud. I mean, I was hearing whispers. I was hearing talking. I was hearing, you know, rustling you, around, people making noise. I was freaking flabbergasted that we were alone. He was convinced that there was somebody who somehow managed to park to the left of us, which is funny because when we reparked, we got the one space that had a clear shot over the overlook. So unless that person was on the world's smallest vehicle or a motorcycle, well, which we definitely would have heard... There were no left park. There were no parking spots to the left of where we were parked. Yeah. Now the thing is, is that I got a little bit of a neck issue going on, so I don't really look to the left too much because it's a physical thing, and I don't want to like strain like I'm looking to the left because it just looks weird. And then I'm, you know, I don't want people looking at me like I'm some kind of. I'm already weirdo as it is. I don't need any you know undue weirdo attention, right? And so that's when I was looking at you, and I'm like, you know, there's people over there. We got to be quiet. And you're like, there's no, there's, and then when I did sort of strain to look over there, I realized that there's just that little bit of grass, like a field, like a small little field area little and trees for dogs to pee. That's how big that field area is. Yeah. And there's like, there's no spot yeah. there. And you know, and I knew that and I'm like, oh yeah. Well, and that's what sort of weirded me out because I kept hearing the talking, the whispers, the, you know, the noises and stuff. And I wonder- and what, 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 here's one thing that, in hindsight, when this whole thing and this whole little, little excursion was, some people say, you're going to see the lights and experience the lights. Other people say, you'll experience weirdness where you are when you hear the owls. It starts with the owls. Yeah. And for me, though, that weirdness and those owls started as soon as we got there. Because well, yeah. when we first got there and I stepped out of the van, um, the first thing I wanted to do was to try to actually stand at the overlook and take, you know, an Instagram photo and what have you. But I had a problem because it seemed, one thing I want to say is the people there are were a little weird. Yeah, I'm sure they're saying the There's same a little thing walk-off us. point to the far right of the overlook where you can walk down and it looks like at one point there was a picnic area which had been destroyed. But there was a dude that was over there and I heard an owl and the dude was I guess he was trying to get photos with whatever type of camera he was using and then he gave up after a while, but he just stayed there. And I don't want to be in the near dark or dusk area with some person I can barely make out. He eventually walked away, but by then I'm walking to the other end of the lookout or overlook where there's some dude hunched down in the grass with headphones on staring over the edge of the overlook. Yeah. And I'm like, great. So now the both two areas I want to investigate, there's somebody there. And I'm sure they're not creepy. If they're listening, I apologize. I'm just socially awkward or whatever. But they were sitting there and there was no way for me to really investigate those areas until those people left. Yeah, well that was the weird thing is that everybody wound up leaving and we didn't notice they were gone. Yeah. And then when they finally did leave, I was like, okay, let's go over to these areas and I just 
I felt like there was still somebody there. Yeah, it was strange. Even though the parking lot is empty. So, that's not cool. (laughs) So, while we were there, we were doing things like recording audio. And when we started hearing that is when activity, as far as what, like what sounded like stuff around us really started picking up. Yeah. And one thing that caught me off guard was I realized I was hearing like little pebbles being thrown into van, little tinks. Yeah. I don't know if that's a, you know, the correct terminology. I'm going to, it's like a little, little tink. And I didn't really notice it right away, but I think about the fourth or fifth tink. I'm like, what? What's going on? Because, you know, if you pick up like a little pea gravel and you just kind of gently toss it. Yeah. I kept hearing it. You know, and and we were moving around, making a little bit of noise. We were getting the camera set up and adjusting it because we had a really, it was was sort of an awkward, it was awkward to try to get it all set up. And one of my goals in the future is to have everything sort of hard mounted so we don't have to worry about it. But, you know, and our video footage is crooked. It was, we weren't actually going to go this far with it, but. Anyway, the camera was recording. We were paying attention to that. We were trying to take some pictures. We were also trying to record audio and be quiet about it so we don't have a bunch of contaminated audio because when you were like, do you hear that? Yeah, you know, And whenever somebody does that to you, <laughs> do you hear that? You automatically hear everything, like super loud. It's like your ears turns up the volume because now you got to listen. Yeah. Um, and that's when I started paying more attention because – Right before that, I'd asked, you know, we need to be able to quiet. You know, we don't. Want and you're like, we're the only ones here, and it's just like, what? <laughs> and so it was a, it was a thing. And these lights, are, they're still going. And there's small little pinpoints on the video, and they're still, you know, sort of flaring up and moving around and doing that. And we kept hearing the noises. And the tree frogs and the hooty owls stopped, and that's when I started hearing the tinks and the yeah. rustling around. You know, it's entirely possible that a lot of the things that we were hearing are, are animals, like little rodents and lizards and weird stuff like that, running around, tromping through some of the leaves, you know, looking for stuff to eat. But it got super quiet. Yeah. And it was like, hmm. The only thing we were missing from our little experience was the fog. You know, the, the paranormal However, mist, right, that sort of rolls in off the Smoky Mountains. But What did I see? I saw shadows yeah so right when i i'm i heard that noise and at the time i had heard it a lot closer to us so i immediately asked greg to break out the the audio recorder and get it ready and i knew that the sound was coming from my side of the van so i grab it and i'm hanging out the window because i'm like i gotta get this sound and because it sounded like it was moving around so as i'm hanging out the window I see one on, okay, if you guys ever go there and you're facing the overlook on the right-hand side, that side of the parking lot had shadows that kept growing and then receding back. And it wasn't out the corner of your eye. It was just, you could look at them and you'd see the shadows move towards you and then recede back. And that started to creep me out. But I got distracted because I heard the sound get closer and you can hear that in the audio. At one point the sound gets closer and judging by how close it got, I turned my eyes to where I thought I was hearing the sound. And when I did, you can see across the Blue Ridge Parkway road, something moved and it moved away from the overlook. And it was about, I want to say on me, I'm short. It was about waist high It was shaped humanoid, but on all fours, and it crawled across the parkway. It crawled across the road. Yeah. When it got to right before, it would break off of the road and onto the grass. Before it got to that point, the shadows happened, and it literally disappeared. Yep. Pretty creepy. So, you're listening to Creepy East Podcast. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. And we're back. 
Okay, so you were telling us about what you've seen, and that sort of spurred a memory for me about I've been sort of editing and, and bringing together audio clips and video that we've recorded while we were at Thomas Divide Overlook looking for the Cherokee lights. Yeah. And I came across something pretty strange. And just to kind of give you an idea, after you had seen what you seen and you told me to roll up the windows and things like that, and it became <laughs> obvious that it was getting to the point where it was time for us to go. Because I started to get so creeped out, but I didn't want to say anything because I have this thing, especially on investigations, where I don't want to influence the other people with me, whether it's you or when we're on a team. I hate influencing other people but yeah. i felt so freaked out i wanted to roll up the windows <laughs> well and that was the thing see because after the hootie owls and it got real quiet and i started hearing little pebble tosses and things like that the tree frogs and the noise came back yeah and it, at that point it was like okay let's go ahead and take a second and i have to get out and take the camera off the roof and do all this stuff but before that actually happened and we made the decision to go well we were running the audio recorder and I was like, you know, Hey, I'm going to get the camcorder and use my atomic flashlight and blast the woods to see what I can see. Right. Yeah. Because we have a big old spotlight and it's like, you can warm up pizza with this thing. And it's like, <laughs> but the thing about it is and in here, and I did that for a little bit and I have little clips of that sort of thing, but the idea of getting out and looking around sort of went away. Uh, I'm going to play a clip and you're going to hear, something that's not us talking and it's not it only happens for about a second but it just sounds really weird it, to me it sounds like gizmo or something from um gremlins, gremlins. Yeah. yeah yeah and is this a Cherokee little person or something like that i don't know but we kept hearing some weird stuff so anyway we're gonna play it real quick and hopefully you can hear it and we're gonna do it right now with my atomic flashlight beam. What do you think? I think I'll share what I think I saw when we drive away from here. When we drive away from here. It's like something I think I saw when we drive away from here. It's like something purring almost. I don't know. And see, the very first time I heard it, I thought that it maybe was hands on the micro on the recorder. Okay. But the problem with that is, is going back and looking at the video and remembering the night, the audio recorder was sitting on the dash. Yeah. So we'll do it one more time and we'll move on. I saw when we drive away from here. And I just want to say that I heard the sound at ear level in a 2018 Ram ProMaster, like at my ear level. So you've got to be six, six feet easy, yeah. right? And it was about two feet away from the side of my head. And I know it was weird because it, it gave me the goose bumps. <laughs> you know, like if somebody walks up and goes, hey, like in your <laughs> ear, It'll make all the hair stand up on your head. It was kind of like that. So I'm like, hmm. I don't think that was my stomach. Now, I am older, and we do eat weird stuff on the road sometimes, and any chance I can get to get a cheeseburger, <laughs> right? <laughs> I'd just like to point out that we did have cheeseburgers beforehand because not only did we go to Thomas Divide Overlook looking for the lights slash Cherokee lights, we also stopped at a weird, mysterious Masonic marker along the parkway. But that was not my stomach. Yeah. And when I said that, it's time to go. So, yeah, anyway, it didn't do it again, and we sort of packed up our stuff and decided to drive away. Now, you didn't want to say anything about what you'd seen until we got on the road because you don't want to influence investigations and or scare the crap out of me. Yeah. And I appreciate that. Well, because it, it caught me so off guard that I, I just, I have a very hard time due to m my past 
dealing with things that I can't under comprehend. Yes. Because I always want to see it again or I want to go and go see it face to face, which is probably not a good idea considering it was this like detailless shadow figure crawling on all fours, but definitely humanoid in shape. Yeah. Yeah. That's probably not something I want to see face to face. Full disclaimer, when you're in the Smoky Mountains or you're on the Blue Ridge Parkway, there are bear everywhere and yeah. there are, you know, elk and things like that. And, you like, know, and you can see just some general weirdness. There's the, even the mysterious and often whispered uh, feral people could be living on the parkway. But either way, when you see something like that, it's time to go. And so that's kind of what we did. Yeah. We sort of uh, decided to, you know, pack it in. So we got the camera in the van. And then, in an act of pure defiance, sat there with the van idling for a minute. Like, we'll leave, but when we're ready. But the windows were up. And that was the thing, too. The little pebbles and the noises that stopped, and then everything came back, and then the little whispers and the weird shadows that you were seeing. And, you know, just being loud with all the talking and activity. It, it Seriously, I thought there was like three or four cars there making a bunch of racket. And then we were completely alone. But see... I'm going to go back to what we were talking about earlier, the whole um, intention thing. Like, what did you intend to see? I was honestly hoping that we'd go up to the Masonic marker and see something. For some reason, I was more set on that than I was Thomas Divide. And the last time we went to that Masonic marker, we got some great shots of an elk. And I was kind of hoping for that again. Yeah. So I was hoping to see large wildlife. And what I saw instead was completely unnerving and made me want to roll up the windows. Yes. Which is, you know, me. I love to run up to wild animals and take close-ups of them. Yeah. But I had no intent of seeing anything at all. I didn't I didn't even really want to set the camera up. As soon as we pulled up, I'm like, this is not. Yeah, and I had to, come on. <laughs> I was like, this, this sucks. This is just a parking lot. You can't see anything. And it started to get dark and then, you know. Yeah. But once the hootie owl started, I remembered reading about, you know, somebody that said, if you hear the hoot owls, you will have some sort of weird experience. And that's when the camera came up. And then, you know, anyway, it is what it is. So we went and we seen some general weirdness and we recorded some video and had audio footage. And, and in that small, about two and a half, two and a half hour time frame, man, there's a lot of stuff to go over. So, yeah. Uh, I just thought it was kind of strange, you know, and it was strange enough to the point where it's like, we will be back. Although for us, it takes a couple hours to get there. So it's something that you can just going to jump in the car and take off. Whereas we were relatively close to the Brown Mountain Lights. It only takes like an hour to get there. Um, But yeah, it, it's, it's sort of a strange thing because what I've noticed is that people will say certain things and certain things you need to do to be able to experience seeing some lights there at Thomas Divide. And then other people say, you know, different, like it's the intent of what you're going to see or what you think you want to see, which can influence what you see. Other people yeah. have reported hearing whispers and talking and things like that, too. But you that know? goes into the, I guess, the indigenous mythology and folklore right, with the, for the area. With the, uh, yeah, that's what I was going to say, because yeah. you are very close to the Koala boundary, which is reservation. It's Cherokee reservation. So Yeah. And, you know, there is lore there with um, – shaman whose family got murdered by the soldiers because the soldiers and they he, they went off into the woods they went you know like up in the mountainside and and it, you know he turned himself in so that the soldiers wouldn't come and it didn't work they did it anyway so yeah so there's some mystery there with that sort of thing and honestly it's like why why haven't we heard You know, you think we, okay, so we've been looking at this sort of thing for a while and trying to find local stuff to go do and see and all that sort of thing, and we would have heard more about it, but we didn't. It was, you know, it was like it was only spoken to us from people that we talked to when it became obvious that we have gone in the area before. You know I mean? It was almost like we had to pass some kind of, like, cool check. Not just a cool check, but kind of throwing some background clout or experience like we go to remote places yeah which kind of makes and in my opinion it's not that remote i mean compared to our previous experiences you know chaco canyon the outlier ruins where we're like 
miles away from it. No, this another. is like four mile. I mean, you turn. Yeah. If you're in Maggie Valley or. Okay. So yeah. where it is, is Thomas Divide Overlook is at mile marker 464 on the Blue Ridge Parkway. But you could be there. I mean, you could have a hamburger and be on the parkway and be at Thomas Divide Overlook in like 20 minutes. Yeah. It's not like it's this remote, desolate area. My my definition, and is that, is our definition of desolate area tainted by our previous experiences? Well, I mean, if you if you break down in the desert and you don't see anybody <laughs> for a day, maybe even two, yeah. I mean, kind of. I, I mean, here, if you break down, you and know. It's funny because this, this Thomas Divide Overlook is not very far from where there's been a couple of episodes of These Woods Are Haunted, you know, and, yeah. and it depicts it as this remote area. And I'm yeah. like, hmm. Remote area, you stop seeing signs every 10 feet. But see, here's the thing, though, and here's where it gets a little bit different. You can step off the parkway out of the parking lot and disappear because yeah. there's so many trees and it, it is so dense. And so when when you see it, it's so it's dense enough to the point where like, you, OK, so like when you talk about the show, these woods are haunted. And, you know, some of our friends were recently on that show, you know, and they're in an area where. You know, you, you can walk half a mile in and it's dark because it's so thick. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I get it. And there are people that go dis- get disappeared off of the parkway. It happens every year. It happens to a lot. And I think that's because it's just so dark and it's those dark areas where it's just, it's hard to move around. You know what I mean? Like you, I, I can see how easily you could get disappeared out there but that speaks Wouldn't to take the much. unique phenomenon of this area where despite the closeness of the area to civilization for some reason people are still going missing yeah. weird things are still happening and i'm so used to and maybe it's my previous experiences my influence i'm so used to the weird stuff happens when there's no other humans around and that's just my my mentality, my train of thought. Yeah. Well, so I, I <laughs> was kind of the same way, mm-hmm. but I don't think that necessarily applies Okay, in certain places. You know what I mean? Because like, okay, there's certain places you go and yeah, you've, you've got to be still and become part of the environment to actually experience anything. Yeah. Right. Be one with nature, that kind of thing. Like right? when we heard music at the outlier ruins. Yeah. yeah. They're having a big, a big old festival, big dancing, big, it sounded like, almost sounded like a powwow. And guess what? Nobody there but us. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, and, and, you, and the thing is, we were so far out and on a mesa, we could physically look and see there was nobody around for at least 20 miles yeah. in every single not direction. E- not even a horse or a car or a cow yeah. or anything. So, yeah, it's a weird thing. And, and that's, Kind of one of those things where, okay, so when you go and you look for things like that, if you go in there with like an, okay, so if you go in there and you're looking for things and you've experienced things from an area, right, it may not be the same when you go into another area. So in other words, it's almost like rules don't apply. (laughs) You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's a weird thing. And it just sort of lends the idea that doing this sort of thing, going out looking for UFOs, ghosts, cryptids, all that sort of thing. The, your preconceived, preconceived set of rules and notions and things that you need to do, I, I don't, in other words, you can't just go in there with one sort of general general set uh, or ideas to, you know, I mean, you can have your basics, but things don't apply, right? So, like, yeah. you can get a van and fully equip it with, like, a weather station and lights and all this other crazy stuff, and none of that stuff may work at all. It may not a it may not you step out of a parking spot and there's some weirdness, you know. So I don't know. It's just a, it's a hard thing, I guess. Yeah. And you know, I can kind of see where maybe investigators can have a hard time because other people are like looking at it from the outside, right? People yeah. are like, well, why didn't you do these seventy five different things? And it's like, well, I wouldn't normally do that because it doesn't apply here, you know. Like, I, well, I don't like know. okay, we parked funny. We ain't, by no fault of our own. The camera was angled funny, but that's like what we're what were we supposed to do? Show up two hours early camp at that park parking spot and make sure nobody else was around i already had weirdos no you can't to and, that, and that's that's yeah a, you know you, it's a natural environment yeah you, and it's public so yeah. it's not like you know and no offense to the weirdos yeah <laughs> they're all right well i mean they'll be fine you know you're not gonna hurt their feelings and it's like i don't, I don't know it just it was weird i had, see and that was the thing when i went into the idea the the masonic marker to me was pretty creepy just in general 
right? And seeing the animals was pretty creepy just in general from the past times we've been there. We get to this little overlook, and it looks like this little grubby parking lot off the side of the road, off the off the parkway. Yeah. Like, and you see there's a million pull-offs in the parkway. You go through tunnels and stuff. There's like three or four of them, you know, and parking spots. So it's pull over and they call them overlooks. Like, hey, you can see this. And you can see all of Maggie Valley and you can see this. And you pull in this one that's just a little grubby sign that says Thomas Divide Overlook parking lot and holds maybe 10 spots. And the overlook's not even that impressive if you're a photographer. No, that, that was my, that was my yeah. thing, right? I'm, we pull in there. I'm like, well, I'm not even going to set the camera up. There's nothing going to happen here. I mean, but it wasn't until we were alone. <sighs> Things got a little off. Yeah. So, and, and here's something too, where you talk about some of the things that you can read on the internet, right? Like if you go to Southern spirit org, there's a section in there that talks about the Thomas divide ghost lights. And he writes to experience the lights. One drives up to Thomas divide overlook after dark and parks facing the Thomas divide Ridge, which is across the Valley, which is where we seen the lights there on the video after flashing your headlights and possibly honking your horn, the lights will appear in the distance. And he says, the first time I saw the lights, they appeared to balls of light that shot up vertically in the air like a bottle rocket, but then circled around and dropped back down to earth and only shoot up again and follow the same route. Uh, the lights were rather dim when I saw them in the middle of summer, but according to an article in the Western Carolina University paper called the Western Carolinian, or Carolinian they are brighter in the wintertime. That's what I seen. Hmm. I seen the lights off on the other ridge. Mm-hmm. I seen one shoot up kind of like a little ball rocket and it went over to the right where another little light was and it went down and disappeared. See, I and saw. And then, hold on, here's the good part. And then I seen like a lizard on a tree <laughs> with its two bright eyes going up to eat bugs. It was crazy. I'm like, what is that? I couldn't tell if it was a lizard or a mouse or something. I was pretty sure it was a lizard. And see, I only saw what you and, and this author have described. I only saw that in the upper left hand side. Yeah. The other things I saw were more um, terrestrial. Or at least tree line, tree level, you yeah, know. You could see that too. But the the whole shooting up thing, I only saw that a couple of times over on the left hand side, whereas you saw them on the right. But just like in this article, you see them better in the winter time. We've heard that about the Brown Mountains. Yeah, and you know why I think that is? Why? Because it's colder, so there's not as much haze from being so oppressively humid and hot. Huh. So certain bodies. So it's just clearer. Because there's it, less haze, yeah. If it's paranatural, certain bodies of gas move sure. better that and way. It's, so it's less smoky in the Smoky Mountains <laughs> when it's cold and clear, <laughs> but right? <laughs> no, but I mean, seriously. Yeah. You know, and so, yeah, it's a weird thing, man. You've got a bunch of different things rolled up in here. You've got Cherokee lore. You've got, like, local sort of urban legend lore. And you've got, you know, people coming from all over evidently to see this. But that's the thing. When we talked to that uh, nice gentleman when we got done with this entire excursion. Yeah. He said that the only people that ever go up there to see this sort of thing are locals. So they've been holding out on us. Well, they just don't say anything or they talk amongst themselves. And unless you're cool, you won't find out about it, which is what we run into here. But not just here. I I know, but I mean, it's more so here than there. I mean, in New Mexico, we got the best views and the best photography when we talked to the locals long enough, you know? So ingratiate yourself with the locals. Yeah. There's a comparison between the Thomas Divide overlook and the lights you see there or the Cherokee lights, right? Mm -hmm. You know, being sort of related to Cherokee little people and Judicola and all this other stuff. And they could do a comparison to the Brown Mountain lights, which they say, you know, these lights could be just as old. Okay. You know, recorded from 18th century, that sort of thing. So I don't know. It was a strange thing. So, yeah, we went up and seen it and really – couldn't see hardly anything at all until the camera was up and we started watching the infrared and it sort of gave us a better idea of what we were looking at. And then we started hearing and seeing the weird stuff. It's hmm. kind of a strange thing. Yeah. Speaking of weird, they would come across this and I thought this was something that was, you know, since it's local to us in our sort of area there, it sort of made sense to kind of talk about it a little bit and it sort of turned into something else as well. Do you remember seeing this? No, this is I from a while ago. Yeah, and, you talking about it? And I seen it, and honestly, I wasn't going to say anything or talk about it too much at all until I started taking a little bit of a deeper look. But um, this came from singular fourteen dot com, and it says North Carolina man reports encounter with hyena like creature. Okay. Now, 
when you look at like cryptids and you're talking about weird things and sort of one-offs like snallygaster and, and dumb stuff. I don't know if you know what snallygaster is. It looks like a bird with snakes for a mouth, but that thing is so weird in look that you know that it wouldn't be a natural thing. Mm-hmm. Right. But a hyena, everybody's seen a hyena, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, you, you see them in zoos, they're on TV. They're, they're not like some mythical animal. Yeah. So if you described a hyena to somebody, they would probably have a frame of reference for it. But this guy, 41-year-old Chris Payne of Haywood County in North Carolina, he spoke with Georgia-based investigator Aubrey Brown recently about an encounter he had with a strange animal outside of Spring Creek either in 2003 or 2004. And Spring Creek is one of those unincorporated counties. It's a small community. It's like less than 1,000 people. Uh, It's at the base of the Great Smoky Mountains in North Carolina's Madison County. So you've got Haywood and Madison County. They're real close to each other, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And he said, I was driving home, just looking forward to get home, honestly, because it had been a long drive. I was maybe 10 uh, 10 minutes from my girlfriend's house, and the roads there are very mountainous and very curvy. And that's one of the things that you run into with the parkway and being so close to it is that the roads just, they switch back on themselves. I hate it. I hate driving through there, right? Yeah. Because, I mean, they are, like, your GPS screen would look like spaghetti noodles. It's sort of, it's just nuts, right? Uh, he said, I came around a curve into a short straightaway, and, you know, my headlights lit up ahead, and I could see red eyes reflecting back from me, or reflecting back at me from the side of the road. So I slowed down because, judging from the height of the eyes, it looked like it was a pretty good size. My first thought was black bear, which would be my first thought, too, because they're everywhere around here. Hmm. He goes, I didn't really want to hit it because hitting a black bear would be an inconvenience, man. It's going to tear up your car. I mean, there's things you got to do if you hit something, right? So He said, so I started slowing down. As I got closer, the shape kind of resolved itself, and it was definitely not a black bear. It looked to me like a large black hyena. Okay. And he says, the posture and the amount of slope going down from the back the hyenas have, you know, high front quarters sloping down into shorter hind quarters, and it was the shape and the head. It wasn't like a dog or a bear, right? Obviously upright and everything. Its head drooped over, looking up just like a hyena. And he said, you know how they hunch forward with their neck down? That's the posture it had. And my immediate impression was hyena. And the closer I got, the more convinced I, I, I was that it, that if it wasn't a hyena, it was something very similar, and it just kind of stared at me as I drove past it, which was fine because I was scared to death. And he says, honestly, I kind of regret not you know, not stopping my truck and staring at it. Yeah. Now, having driven those roads, I don't think we would have stopped and looked at it either because you, just, you take your life in your hands if you stop out there. Exactly, because I... Went on to Google real quick because I'm like, I know we've driven past here. Oh, we've been through there a couple times. Yeah. And many it's times. It's like right outside Mount Mitchell. It's right. during that really curvy area yeah. where it doesn't seem like it's curvy on a map until you're on the road right. and you are literally going to fly off the side of the mountain. Yeah. And we're driving a van. So I hate it. <laughs> I hate it. with that. And you know what? And I always forget and go that way. And it angers me. And it takes forever to get home because you can take that same way. Um, like if you're in and around the Brown Mountain Light. So, I mean, you're going to run into this sort of curvy thing. It's it's not fun to drive. Not even like, I don't know. Yeah. So, he basically said when he was asked for any further details about the creature, it was dark and the best I could tell um, is that the color wasn't solid black. And it appeared to have short, coarse hair. Hmm. And he said, you know, he didn't think it was a mangy bear or otherwise. Now, and, and we're going to, we've said this many times in podcasts before, uh, it's always people that are not from the area that seem to think that people that grew up in the area or that are from that area would misidentify a common animal that they would see. Which, right? And they never do. Which also brings to mind the, we didn't talk about it earlier, but my 14 term of the day, which was the not deer, because some skeptics are now claiming that the not deer is most likely a deer-like animal that has stunted growth and has something called CWD, which is chronic wasting disease, similar to mad cow disease, and allows for that jerky paranormal motion. Yeah. So that's just a description from somebody outside the area or who may not 
be present when this particular experience happens. Yeah, or be familiar enough with the flora and the fauna of the area and then fully expects the person that sees something that's from that area and has seen that stuff for their entire lives to not be able to identify a mangy, weird deer with a disease or a black bear with balding spots or a dog. I mean, it it is a valid skeptical rebuttal, but still, if you are there in the moment and something strikes you so suddenly that you ignore the fact you're on a deadly road, Yeah, <laughs> you know, you're going to absorb it. I mean, kind of like that the first time you and I went to Spruce Pine and I swore to God, there was a dude standing on the side of the road. And then I find out from our friend Heather and her daughter, they've seen that same guy. Yeah. And then we meet somebody who lives in Spruce Pine who had an experience at that particular spot too. Yeah. That stays with you. You know exactly what you saw. Yeah, like he said, uh, he didn't think he'd seen a wild boar since they lack the special layer behind the retina that reflects light back into and help them, you know, improve light uh, night vision mm-hmm. in low light conditions and causes eye shine. The guy knows what he's talking about. Yeah. You know, like, did you know that a wild boar does not have that little special layer or whatever that makes the eye shine? No. No. So he says, Payne said he was certain he'd seen something unusual and explained that his girl, to his girlfriend's parents, right? You know, we, we're the straight and narrow types, so no drinking. I wasn't rather sleepy. We ate dinner, and I lay down for a nap, and I was fairly fresh when I left. Yeah. I don't know. I thought it was kind of strange because it, it was something that happened in this area. And then so, of course, I took a look because I've never heard of, like, North American hyenas because they're not from here, right? No. And so, according to Mysterious Universe, Mysterious Hyena Monsters in North America, written by Brett Swanser in June of 2019, says, uh, There are all manners of creatures skirting out past the fringes of what we know, inhabiting a realm that we cannot at this time fully understand. So, he talks about some of these, um, what looks for all means and intents and whatever intents and purposes, like a very hyena-like creature in nature. In the Great Plains of the American Northwest, or American West, it was a creature they called the Shunka Rarakin. Yeah. Um, in their language, that translates to carries off dogs. Yeah. Which is an accurate description of a hyena. It's a brutish, dark-furred beast with a sloping back, massive jaws, long front legs, compared to the rear, looking very much, like you're saying, like a hyena. Yeah. But the, a hyena, in all practicality, a hyena would not make sense in this area. The type of fur, the type of skin on that creature. I mean, as a logical explanation, maybe somebody who keeps wildlife and exotic animals, maybe one got loose. To um, well, see one here is check so it out. unnerving. Native tribes and early white settlers of the area who typically described it as being a very large, heavy set with a build somewhat reminiscent of a cross between a wolf and a hyena uh, with black uh, to dark red fur, and some settlers have even claimed they've shot it and mounted specimens, specimens of these beasts, and that there is at least one mysterious mounted specimen that was allegedly shot in Montana in 1886 by Israel Amon. Yeah, but, Hutchins. but see, that's all Idaho, Montana, the Great Plains. Here in western North Carolina, the environment would have that creature very out of place. Sure, you know? but... There's even more when it comes to these sort of things, right? Because you've got, like, hey, there was allegedly a hyena hyena sighting in Mississippi. Okay. So the the point is, yeah, yeah, the point is, is that this thing is not necessarily just, I think, a local sort of experience that happened here in North Carolina, like a one-off kind of thing. It's like Texas and Mississippi, Montana. There's been a bunch of places that where people have reported seeing what looks to be a hyena and see, like I, a hairy hyena and that's the thing i want to attribute it to a you know an exotic wildlife you know like maybe a a train with zoo animals wrecked and the yeah, hyena like, got out and yeah. well okay so if that be the case right think about it though um they're not just indigenous to africa right i mean they could be all over the place but what if you had like say a train wreck and this hyena Boyfriend and girlfriend got out and made more hyenas and did all this. And over time, they become more um, acclimated to the environment that they're currently in. Could they survive? Because even if you go out west, if somebody's cold in the wintertime, it's like the African plains out there. Yeah. 
you know, you get like places in New Mexico where they release those like Ibez things, those like uh, cantaloupe, not cantaloupe. Or what was like, it, camels in Texas or something? Yeah, so know? they could survive, and it gets cold there. And a lot yeah. of animals, when they know that it gets cold, their bodies start to produce the long fur, and it gets the brown fat layer, all the stuff that we as humans have gotten rid of because we yeah. don't need it. So, I, I know, it's just, yes, I am very interested, and I think it's po- possibly plausible for, like, the, the, the Great Plains. Mississippi, though? Or here in North Carolina, that's where I'm like, what did they see, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it would be easier for a hyena-like creature to survive in a place where there's lots of stuff to eat. Yeah. And here's something, and kind of the reason why I really wanted to kind of bring this up and talk about it is remember the nice older school teacher lady that somehow or another got attacked and was like kind of ripped and- apart by something, and they didn't know what it was, and they just basically said – Unknown canine. Yeah. And we thought originally, maybe this is a dog man type thing because yeah. of the area. Everybody is like dog man on that. Right. And they checked all the local area uh, animals, like the, you know, the canines, and checked the DNA and nothing matched. Mm-hmm. What if there really is a sort of a paranatural type creature, a natural cryptid, like a North American hyena, and she got attacked by that. And maybe these things are transitory going to where it gets warmer in the wintertime, like, you know, doing their migratory routes like they would do, where they're opportunistic feeders, carrying away dogs and other stuff that they know they could get into and eat. Like, hyenas eat a lot of stuff. They, they're they not just, like, they're not choosy when it comes to what they eat. And they, these are, hyenas are not little. That's Like, th- people yeah. think they're like these little dogs. They're not. They're huge. And, and like the whole dog thing. See, the problem is hyenas are outside of both the dog family and the cat family. Yes. Uh, they actually get described as filiform carnivoran mammals, which would be something outside of the normal DNA testing for like that, the elderly school teacher we were talking about. It's not right. exactly like the local labs have hyena DNA lying around. So that that's a really interesting, you know, uh, hypothesis right there but it's just it's such an out of place creature and looking at one you're you're gonna be stunned because it's not quite a dog it's not quite a cat it has a very um scavenger trickster appeal to it in its behaviors so that's why they're I'm, pretty robust yeah as a creature yeah there's another sighting in 2010 oh. in adirondack park adirondack yeah. park Right in the southern Adirondacks, <laughs> am I saying it wrong? Adirondacks, however you say it, of New York, right? Okay. So you have one in 2010 in New York, in the Adirondacks. Well, I guess it's like a forest. I don't know. What that is. So, um, and here's what they said. Right, my wife and I saw what can only be described as a hyena chasing several deer across the road. The animal literally stopped dead in front of the car and was staring back at us for 10 seconds before moving off. Uh, I've been in the woods my whole life, raised with a gun since childhood, and spent summers. You spent my summers on Lake Champlain. I've I've hunted, fished, instructed archery and rifle uh, range, hunted, fished, and you know, so hiked, uh, hunted raccoons at night, owned horses and ridden horseback throughout the wilderness, and presently lived with all kinds of wildlife on my lakefront creekside property. Well, I thought I'd seen it all, but I have no idea what this was other than to say it was it was a hyena, and it was very large, one hundred and fifty to one hundred seventy five pounds. Um, long, bushy tail, brindle, wiry, spotted, brown, black, a gray coat, very powerful predator build, thick lower jaw, rounded diamond shaped triangular head with rounded ears sitting high on the head and what appeared to be a mane running down the back, originating on the neck. And its hind legs are noticeably shorter than the front, much thicker and more powerfully muscled than the front. Right. So, then the, so, so, okay. When I read stuff like this, I started thinking, well, is it possible for a hyena and a dog or a wolf to create these hybrids, right? Because, like, maybe a train, you know, cruising across, maybe something like that happened where some hyenas escaped, right, from a zoo or something, right? hmm No. They yeah. don't interbreed. They can't. Because it's a different species. Right. Yeah, like I was saying, the exactly. fully form carnivoran or whatever. So, I don't know, man. So, if there is the possibility of a North American hyena, the more you start looking into it, the more it starts to make sense. But... I don't know. I'm looking at this one, obviously, this one Wikipedia picture. And if you were to shade it in a darker color, I could picture the um, a fully manged near-death bear looking like this. Sure. You know, so. 
You could, but just because you can explain it as that, does that mean (laughs) that's really what it is? Because, you know, you could easily say the shadow you seen was also like a little skinny bear. True. You know, I mean, but that's the thing, though. It's like, okay, so just because you can explain it, does that mean that's what it really is or what it happened? I don't know. Maybe maybe that's what skeptical people need to do, right? You you look at something like that and you try to explain it in a way that makes sense. So you can say, okay, well, maybe it's not whatever, right? Maybe it makes you feel better. Right. So when they talk about seeing some of these things, Michigan, Ontario, and Canada, they all have their own version of the Wahila, which is the Ontario white wolf, which describes pretty much what you see, which looks like this thing, mm-hmm. this hyena monster thing. So it, it won't like one was spotted in Illinois, like outside of Johnson City in 2008. What? So there, if you start to look, there are sightings. That have happened throughout time, all over the North American, I don't want to say continent, but all throughout North America yeah, and Canada. I didn't even look what was below the U.S. because I started looking into it. I'm like, hmm. So is it more likely that you could find a hyena in the wild, like a North American hyena? Who, he probably isn't hiding. I mean, you've got people out there that believe in Sasquatch and all these thousands and thousands of, you know, experiences, but nobody's got any proof at all. <laughs> Right, so what makes this hyena, which is, I think, could probably live here no problem, honestly, because I mean they got them in zoos and stuff. I don't know from from like a zoobiological perspective, I guess. I have a hard time with certain species that do not belong or have not been found on certain continents currently in modern times existing on continents without the help or aid of humans such as exotic breeders and stuff like that so it's interesting uh maybe it's possible i'm I'm just not sure especially because it's such a different species and has such unique requirements yeah well if you can if you do it like everybody that sees or hunts sasquatch right i'm gonna pick on people Mm -hmm. well there's a creek And there's some, you know, some wild flowers and some berries. So, yeah, Sasquatch could totally live here. Yeah. You know, oh, there's a deer running around. Yeah. This would be a perfect environment for a Sasquatch to live. So, if you look at that mentality, right? Sure. Yeah, it's a dog. There's lots of rabbits and all sorts of wild stuff to eat all over the U.S. And there's water to drink and there's garbage cans to get into and there's chickens and cows and other dogs and other wild animals and we're pack animals in general so we can you know we can eat all sorts of stuff why couldn't he live here i can use our own valley as an example on or contradictory to that a couple months ago or a month ago lots of bunnies bunnies all over our front yard every evening between 4 and 8 p.m bunnies all over the place not a lot of predator activity we heard about it from yep. neighbors, but didn't actually see it or hear it ourselves. And now, every night for the past two weeks, I'm hearing coyotes yep. nonstop. I think a hyena would eat a coyote. Actually, technically, it's bigger than, than East well, Coast coyotes, so yes. What did, what did they call a wahala? Or wahala? It, it's a, one, who draw, one who drags dogs away. Yeah. So I'm hearing coyotes here. I'm hearing large predators here right now, but not a lot of bunnies. And there's a comment. In one of these articles, right? It says, saw something just like this in 1995 in northern Indiana, of all places. I was with my daughter. She was six at the time. She saw it and said, what's that? It was running along the west edge of the north south tree line, north, uh, south tree line late afternoon in full sunlight. Had a very clear view of what it was for five to six seconds. I told her it was just a big dog, but it looked exactly like a large, dark red hyena. Hmm. Didn't make any sense. And if you go to Google, there's a description of a brown hyena, and it's relatively long hair. It matches one of the earlier descriptions we yeah. talked about. So. so, I don't know. So, anyway, we thought we'd throw that in there with the podcast, and I think we're getting ready to kind of take a second and get ready to wrap it up a little bit. Um, but, yeah, I thought that was kind of weird that in this particular area, and, you know, that could describe a lot of weird stuff that people see where it's not a bear, it's not a Sasquatch, Right, it's mm-hmm. not a wolf. It's not a coyote. It looks like a big old dog, or it could be a hellhound or something. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's just a North American hyena. Okay. Maybe you come cruising across. Uh, you know, who? I don't know. See, mm-hmm. there's probably not that many of them. Probably eating bad grapes, <laughs> something like that. But yeah, I don't know. So Thomas Divide Overlook was pretty sketchy for us. It was fun. We got to see some stuff, and then the North American hyena is probably out there in the woods. Can you imagine seeing something like that? 
Yeah. Only because I've been face to face with stuff I wasn't expecting before. So You're like, hmm, that's not a mangy old bear. <laughs> but see, and this could and we're getting ready to wrap, but I just wanted to tie in one thing. Seeing this um seeing this thing, right? Mm-hmm. Or seeing something that could be described as a North American hyena. If you've never seen anything like that before and you seen it out there running off with one of your goats. Yeah. What would you think that is? See, at first I want to say it's a mangy coyote. Right, but no, no, you're missing yeah. my point here. Okay. It's the freaking chupacabra. Okay. Because remember how chupacabra went from being like what looked kind of like a dog crazy looking thing and then for a while there became this alien goat sucker looking like thing? Like reptilian. Yeah. Yeah. So if you go back to like the Texas description or New Mexico or basically, you know, the North American description, not the Puerto Rico description of, of chupacabra. Yeah. I mean, the skinny legs, and it could be describing what could be a North American, a North American hyena. Yeah. So this thing, if it's a real thing, could be being misidentified as other scary, weird stuff. (laughs) So is it a goat sucker chupacabra? Nope. It's a North American hyena. Okay. There you go. So one of the things that you were talking about um, and going to bring up was the not deer, which is super creepy. And see, I wanted to bring this up because we were in the area for this. We were in the Koala Boundary. We're in the Smoky Mountain National Park region. And that's typically where we hear about experiences of the not deer. Now, th- the only coherent example I could find of it was actually from Not Deer Magazine. And we have a link to everything we talk about in the show notes. But the, the short description is the Appalachian Not Deer is a folk cryptid with sightings common in the foothills of Virginia, but they are, aren't bound to be a specific location. For example... We get a lot of reports near the Cherokee area. Now, unlike Mothman or the Jersey Devil, the not deer seem to be a phenomenon rather than one creature specifically. Sightings typically occur at night or in the early evening morning when visibility is low. Most people describe the not deer's appearance to be uncomfortable because it so closely resembles a deer, but, well, it's not. (sighs) And right there, I want to interject with the author because we've talked on previous episodes of the concept of uncanny uncanny valley, which is where humans will see something that's humanoid but not quite, but whatever it was, during our evolution, we saw something like that, and it scared us so bad that future generations and our offspring know to be wary of things that don't, are not what they appear. Yeah. And this Something not, that's just not right. Yeah. And this not deer follows that example because when you look at it, you're like, that's a deer. But then it's a deer with six legs. Or it's a deer that walks like an 80s music video, like all herky-jerky. Or it's a deer, but then it turns its head and it's not a deer. Yeah. And we've had reports in just offhand conversation with a couple of people who did not want to come on the podcast. And it was just a general conversation that you work into after talking for like an hour to some of these folks and get them comfortable. And this could be somebody who's never had a paranormal experience before, but they've hunted or they've been in these mountains their entire life. They came across something because they thought they were deer hunting and what they saw was not a deer. No. See, that's the kind of stuff I think it would make me want to run. Now, I think it's interesting that the area we're talking about, the Cherokee area, uh, that's where mythos and folklore pertaining to the deer woman or the deer man uh, coincide because that was the most common creature in the area. But to sa- say that there's a not deer, there's a thing that is a deer but isn't, that is unnerving. And that's kind of secretly what I was hoping for the couple of times we've gone to the Masonic marker because that thing makes no sense to me. So why not see something that doesn't make sense in a place that doesn't make well, sense well, to me? Well, I would rather see a North American hyena from a distance <laughs> than a freaking not deer. And that's the other And what's it going to do? Whistle at you or call your name? You're going to answer back? No. But some well, of these, But what? That's how you get some, gone. Yeah, some of these not deer descriptions have like an anthropomorphic detail to them Mm. where it's capable of near human things like whispers that might be six feet tall 
next to your van. Yeah. I see. <laughs> I want to see that stuff from a distance so I can go, wow, look at that. That's crazy. I don't want to be like right up on me, breathing on me like, hey. Now, we've had, you know, our unusual experience in the in the Cherokee and the Koala Boundary. Uh, we have this article that I linked to that has some, some very uh, – skeptical or analytical explanations for it but what they're ex- they're describing in the first half of the article makes me think they've had their own experience probably i mean and it coincides with the hyena because some descriptions and this guy gets super detailed forward facing eyes elongated mouths like dogs or coyotes claws instead of hooves uh the capacity to stand on two legs as well as four that sounds nothing like a deer. That sounds like a hyena a little bit. Mm. So that's why I wanted to talk about this before we stop the podcast, because I am totally into this phenomenon. Uh, if anybody else has a not deer experience, I want you to share it with the podcast. Uh, contact at creepgeeks.com or go to our website, creepgeeks.com and click that contact us form. Hit us up on social media. You know we're on there. So I want more not deer experiences. Maybe we'll revisit this and do an episode on it. Yeah. You know? <laughs> mm. Yeah. Kind of weird. Kind of creepy. All right. So anyway, there we go. We're going to go ahead and take a second wrap up the podcast. This has been episode 266 for our brand new start of season six. So we do hope you tune in again. Yes. Uh, we do podcasts weekly unless there's a major holiday, and sometimes we celebrate those because why not? Make sure you give the show a call if you'd like to leave us a message or tell us your experience. That phone number is going to be 575-208-4025, and yes, that is a Roswell area code for all you UFO nerds. There you go. Uh, thank you to our Patreon supporters and to all our listeners. If you give us a listen... Uh, give us a review. Reviews help the podcast grow. Very nice. And this podcast is available for, on any and every major podcast player out there. So yeah, don't be scared to subscribe and listen. Uh, so anyway, there you go. See you later. Take it easy. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.